How's it going everybody? Welcome back to my channel. If this is your first time here, thanks for stopping by. This is uh, one of my lectures that I do. I used to teach undergraduate kinesiology and uh, this these are the lectures from my biomechanics course. If you're new to this channel, I've done a bunch of lectures leading up to this, uh, looking at different joints and areas of the body, so check those out if you're new. If you've been following along, along thanks again for coming back. I had thought about ending this series, but I looked back to my lectures and found some other ones that I think people might be interested in. And this is one of them. This is actually an area that I find to be really fascinating, uh, just looking at our nervous system and, um, you know, the biomechanics of our nerves, just thinking about, you know, all pain at the end of the day is neurogenic. It comes from our nervous system. And there are some people who have pain issues that are related to stress on the nervous system. So it's interesting to look at the science of this and then I'll touch a little bit on, you know, mobilization techniques and things like that uh, that can be used to treat neurogenic type pain. Um, or I should say, you know, maybe not neurogenic, but pain that comes from actual stress on our nervous system. So we'll look a little bit uh, at that towards the end of this lecture. So all right, let's jump into it. So just, you know, starting off, let's just look at structure and function. Hopefully this is review for a lot of people, but uh, if it's new to you, that's great too. So we'll just look a little bit at some basic divisions, structures, and functions of the nervous system. There are three broad roles, roles we'll think about with the nervous system. So first, we're going to think about incoming sensory information or afferent information that our nervous system is collecting about our body and environment. So, right, this could be all of our touch type receptors, vision, hearing, uh, all of these types of, this type of sensory information, proprioceptors in our joints, um, you know, sensory information from systemically from our organs, uh, things like that. So we're going to have all that afferent information leaving our tissues, going away from our tissues, towards our central nervous system. And then we'll have some processing and interpretation of these of this sensory information. So uh, we talk about this a lot with pain, for example. So we have nociceptive, we have free nerve endings, nociceptors in our tissue, and those detect dangerous things. And then that goes to our central nervous system and brain where that information is interpreted with all other sensory information, taking into account vision, hearing all the things that are happening in the vir environment and things that are happening to our body. We're going to process all of that and then determine an appropriate response, which <clears throat> in the musculoskeletal system, we will mainly talk about muscular contractions. Usually if a response is needed, we will move in some way. We'll contract our muscles, move our joints so that movement can be created. So again, if there's something dangerous, I touch a hot stove, something like that. I touch, I have uh, sensory information sent to my central nervous system, processing happens, and the appropriate response is I need to get my hand off of that hot stove. So I have muscular contractions of, you know, my elbow flexors so that I remove my hand from the dangerous uh, situation. So, but besides muscular contractions, we could have gland secretion, you know, that's happening internally to also aid in, you know, that, that response. Okay, so kind of those three broad rules. Uh, and then when we look at structure, you know, we'll have the central nervous system or CNS, which includes our brain and spinal cord. And then we're going to have the peripheral nervous system, which are the components that extend out from the central nervous system. So we, when this lecture, will mainly talk about, uh, you know, spinal nerves. But remember, we've also got our 12 pairs of cranial nerves. And those are the nerves that are going to extend out and give us sensation and motor function to, you know, muscles like, uh, or sorry, nerves that will be involved in moving the muscles of our face, giving us, uh, you know, allowing us to taste things, moving our eyes, uh, you know, um, moving the tongue. It's going to be all those kind of, those are our cranial nerves. So, uh you know, in terms of musculoskeletal science, we won't talk a whole lot about those, but they do come up in certain areas. So today we'll focus mainly on our spinal nerves, 
which are going to pretty much start in the cervical spine, you know, go out to our arms, thoracic spine, and then the lumbar spine, which will go out to our legs. So the branches of those spinal nerves become our large peripheral nerves that we often talk about. You might think of, you know, the median nerve, the ulnar nerve, the radial nerve, musculocutaneous nerve, those big nerves in the upper extremity, and then the lower body, you know, we've got femoral nerve, sciatic nerve, tibial nerve, peroneal nerve. All those are all of our large peripheral nerves. And so we'll talk about ma mainly about the biomechanics of those structures today. So, you know, and just a little bit more review on the anatomy side, the spinal cord ends at the L1 level of our spine. So that's L1 is the first level of the lumbar spine. So it's sort of our upper low back. And that, the spinal cord ends in a structure called the conus medullaris. And then below that, you don't really, you don't have the spinal cord anymore. You have the cauda equina, which means horse's tail. And if you look at this image here, it's kind of nice. You can see the spinal cord is this tightly wrapped structure that comes down the spine. And then as we get to the upper lumbar spine, we don't have that cord anymore. These, the spinal cord branches into the lumbosacral nerve roots. And that, you know, is said, is thought to look like a horse's tail. So it's, it was called the cauda equina. So just a little bit there, uh, anatomy review on the central nervous system as it extends out into the peripheral nervous system and how it changes throughout the different regions of the spine. <clears throat> and then if we look at uh, spinal nerve structure, so now we're getting out into the peripheral nervous system, we've left the spinal cord, and this here is a cross section of the spine. It might seem a little abstract to look at here, but imagine taking the spine in vertical and kind of cutting it in half and then looking down on it. So if you can imagine, this is the front of the body, and then this is the back of the body. So the back side or posterior side is also called the dorsal side of the spine and the anterior side or front side is also called the ventral side. But this would be our vertebral body. You know, so you have the bones, the vertebrae of the spine. This is the body, which is on the front side. These are all the, where our spine stacks together. Okay, the spinal cord is right here. And then on the back side is the ventral, the posterior arch of the spine. You know, right here is the spinous process. This is the little bone you can feel on your back, your backbone there, you know, you'd think of what you can palpate and feel. So inside here, so here's the spinal cord, right, which is our central nervous system. Extending out from the spinal cord is our peripheral nervous system. And we're going to talk about two roots. So there's a posterior root or dorsal root on the back side right here. And then there's a ventral or anterior root. And those carry different types of information. So incoming information, so out here is the body. Imagine the leg or arm is out here. Something touches your arm. That's gonna, that, that afferent sensory information is gonna come through this posterior or dorsal side. So we often refer to the posterior dorsal root as the sensory root. So it's gonna come through the backside and into the spinal cord and then ascend up the spinal cord to the brain. And then when a response is determined to be appropriate, that motor information will go out this ventral or anterior route, so to travel out here, out to the muscles of the arm or leg and create movement. So just a little bit on the structure of our spinal nerves. So we've got the dorsal root, sensory, anterior root, ventral root is our motor. And those roots unite to form uh, those spinal nerves, the roots unite to form our spinal nerves at this intervertebral foramen. This is a intervertebral a foramen as a whole, and the intervertebral foramen is basically where <clears throat> each spinal nerve is coming out on our right and left sides. So this is also an area where we, you know, where people sometimes have nerve root uh, issues. So maybe something like they have stenosis. Maybe somebody's got stenosis in their spine and there's a narrowing of this intervertebral foramen and that uh, interferes with function of the spinal nerve and might cause numbness, tingling, pain down an arm or down the leg. And if it's severe enough, maybe it causes some motor changes and they end up having weakness, atrophy in those muscles. and. We'll look at some of those things, but this intervertebral foramen is an area that's looked at a lot in both, you know, with orthopedic surgeons and in the rehab world, especially with things like stenosis, 
disc herniations that are large enough can cause some stenosis at the intervertebral foramen. So it's an important area when we're considering health of the nervous system. Okay. Uh, there's connective tissues uh, related to our nerves, and this might be surprising. You know, we often talk about these with the uh, with our muscles, with you know, connective tissues and fascias that cover our muscles. But we also have these uh, same types of divisions that we see in muscles in nerves. So you might remember if you've studied muscle physiology, we have the epi, peri, and endomyceum. So we have those same divisions, but we've got epi, peri, and endoneurium. So these are going to be connective tissue layers that protect our nerves in different ways and cover each area of the nerve. So if we start, uh, so basically function from a function standpoint, like I said, these are going to be, neural tissue is, you know, is sensitive, it's susceptible to especially stretching and compression forces, which we'll look at more later. But these basically help to cushion the nerves in different areas of the body where they're more susceptible and to help protect against stretch uh, type forces. And again, we have the epi, peri, and endoneurium working from most superficial to deeper. So we'll look at those in a little more detail. The epineurium, again, is the one that's most located most superficially, closest to, this, to the outside of the body. Uh, so the epineurium, you can, maybe you can see here labeled, it's basically on, if you take a nerve, it's sort of on the outside of the nerve. It's a really uh, useful for protecting against, cushioning the nerve and protecting against compression. So if some outside thing were pushing on the body and pushing in on that nerve, that epineurium would act as sort of a cushion to the nerve. And then just below that is the, oh, and again, this also helps in terms of maintaining blood supply for the nerve, which uh, nerves are interesting, right? They have uh, nerves, and this, these are things that people don't always think about, but their ner your nerves have their own blood supply, their own microcirculation, and they have their own nerves, right? Your nerves can sense when something dangerous is happening to them. So your nerves have their own nerves, which I think uh, you know people don't always think about. So the nerve itself, if something dangerous or uh, you know potentially damaging is happening to the nerve, the nerve needs some way to communicate back to the brain and spinal cord about its status. So again, our nerves have their own nerves. Um, and then uh, <clears throat> this epineurium is going to be most prominent because it's good at cushioning. It's going to be most abundant near bony prominences. So you might think about, you know, spots where like maybe you think about the ulnar nerve and the funny bone. You know, we all hit that and it hurts like crazy, but there's going to be extra, it had an extra degree of epineurium around that area because it's more vulnerable to compression. It's near kind of that bony prominence. Uh, so that, you know, that's just one example where we'd think about, you know, but also, you know, maybe in the spine, again, we were looking at that intervertebral frame and where those nerves are exiting the spine, they're close to, you know, uh, bones on either side. You could see a buildup of epineurium there to help protect against compression. In the cervical spine, for instance, we have very little room for nerves. And so they're always being sort of stretched and compressed. And so extra connective tissue can help protect them. And then perineurium is just below the epineurium. This is going to wrap around these fascicles. So we have, like muscles, if you've, again, if you've studied muscles, we have the whole muscle, and then we have these fascicles inside, and nerves are the same kind of structure. We've got these fascicles within the nerve, and just on the perimeter of the fascicle will be the perineurium. This has great, bio, great mechanical strength. It's also said to serve as a biochemical barrier, so it helps to preserve the ionic environment inside the uh, nerves themselves. Okay, so it has, besides having a mechanical role, it has, also has this uh, biochemical role. And then the deepest layer of connective tissue is the endoneurium. This is going to be composed of collagen, that protein we think about you know, all throughout the body, the most abundant protein in the body, especially found in connective tissues, bone, ligament, tendon, fascia, all these different connective tissues. And so we see it here uh, in the nervous system as in, you know, uh, something that's protecting the nerves. And fibroblasts are the, that base cell that we think about with, um, you know, these, these connective tissues. 
So when we think about biomechanical biomechanics of peripheral nerves, so we're getting out away from the brain and spinal cord into the peripheral nervous system, there are different things that can compromise and injure our nerves. We could have external traumas like, uh, you know, maybe there's something like a motor vehicle accident, right? Car accidents uh, are something, sports injuries and in American football, maybe someone's tackled, uh, something like that could impact the nerve. Um, even just hitting your funny bone, right? Like that is a type of tr external trauma to the nerve. And then we have things called entrapments. And these are situations where it's thought that a nerve is compromised because of something inside the person's body. And this is often talked about with um, muscles that may be spasming or tight. So one example that a lot of people are going to be fam familiar with would be piriformis syndrome. And again, that name, piriformis syndrome, sort of the science behind that is changing. And piriformis is just one structure that can potentially entrap a nerve, the sciatic nerve in this case, and um, decrease its health. But we have lots of other spots like that, uh, muscular entrapments, you know, people will talk about pronator teres and the median nerve as another example. We can have other entrapments that aren't related to muscles. Again, you could have a really large disc herniation that interferes with movement of a nerve root and that could be a type of entrapment. So scar tissue is one, maybe someone had an injury where something was torn or they had surgery and uh, that scar tissue interferes with movement of structures including our nervous system. So those are different types of uh, issues that can interfere with the biomechanics of peripheral nerves. Stretch, stretch injuries and compression injuries are the most common and we'll spend uh, most of our time talking about these so we can have situations. Our nerves do have the ability to stretch a little bit and slide, but rapid lengthening or a crushing type of thing, um, these types of traumas can irreversibly uh, damage our peripheral nervous system. Most people are aware that the brain and spinal cord cannot regenerate. So if you, right, if you injure your spinal cord and you're paralyzed, at this point, we don't really know how to heal that, and it can't heal on its own, so people end up being in wheelchairs, or you know that, that ends up being a permanent thing. With the peripheral nervous system, it can regenerate to a certain degree, depending on the severity of the injury. If it's really severe, uh, it, it won't be able to regenerate either. So we'll look at some of these details related to when a nerve is stretched and when it's compressed, at what point does that become irreversible? So we'll look more at that. Here's a, you know, uh, just an image to kind of think about peripheral nerve injuries, thinking about the cervical spine here. We could have compression or stretch injury in something like football. You know, if somebody's head, or in a car accident, right, if the head and neck were cranked into side bend to one side, that could cause, that would cause compression on one side of the spine and a stretch on the other side of the spine. So, when we think about all these nerves exiting the neck and the intervertebral foramens where they're coming out, the neck is really jammed down hard on one side, that closing sort of compressive force, foraminal narrowing, remember we talked about the intervertebral foramen, that foramen is that hole where the nerve is exiting and so foraminal narrowing happens naturally when we move, but if we were jammed really hard and past our normal range of motion, it could injure our nervous system. And then again, on the flip side, you know, our nerves are always stretching and being compressed. It's normal. It's just that's what happens in human movement. But if we move beyond that, if our head were really, if someone fell and got hit, it could stretch the nerves on one side, and that could cause temporary or even permanent changes to the peripheral nerves. So the when we think about nerves, there's this mechanical interface we'll often talk about, and the musculoskeletal system you know, it's going to be that mechanical interface to the nervous system. So our nervous system is this continuous thing, right? Brain, spinal cord, and then the peripheral nerves are coming out. The whole thing is continuous. It's interconnected and something very far down at your wrist can actually affect, you know, how the nerves are moving at the spinal cord. And this has been studied in cadavers where they put pins in the nerves and then move the body and they look at how, how movement in one area affects another area. So your nervous system is this continuous structure and it's not there by itself, right? It's running by bones and ligaments and tendons and muscles. And so those structures are constantly, as we move, stretching and compressing our nerves. And most of the time our nerves can handle that, but if something is done 
at an intensity that you know is something that's held for too long or is a greater force than the nervous system is ready for it can cause pain numbness tingling um, these kind of neural type symptoms even sitting for long periods right you probably all experience if you sit on the wrong type of chair you just sit for too long your leg might go to sleep I mean that ends up being a compressive force a compressive stress on the sciatic nerve right we've all had that happen your leg goes to sleep your arm goes to sleep you are creating some sort of mechanical stress on the nerve and you know in a healthy state we move and then the nerve blood flow and oxygen returns to the nerve and it comes back to normal but an arm or leg going to sleep is an example of a sort of less severe nervous system stress so you know all of us are pretty familiar with that <clears throat> uh, so our nerves have to elongate they can stretch a little bit just a little you know they can stretch a little bit they slide or glide so we'll talk about that and that's where mobilization techniques are often thought to be uh, helpful helping nerves slide and glide you've maybe heard of nerve flossing that's kind of what this gets at compression and tension uh, all these things are happening with our nervous system uh, during movement and so if somebody starts having nerve symptoms, then we want to start looking at what's happening with this mechanical interface interface in the musculoskeletal system, external traumas, what maybe is happening there that's leading to these nerve symptoms and what can we do about it. So when we are thinking about the physiology of nerves, there are different ways that it's hypothesized uh, where the nerve could be affected, functions of the nerve that could be affected that could lead to problems and symptoms. And so there's sort of three main variations or areas. Uh, one is blood flow. So again, our nerves uh, have, our peripheral nerves have their own microcirculation. And so if something, a pressure or a stretch were put on a nerve, we could impact, could decrease blood flow. And that would decrease, obviously, oxygen delivery, nutrient delivery to the nerve. That could lead to issues in the nerve. Axonal transport. And this picture shows, you know, just kind of the anatomy of a nerve, but we have the cell body and dendrites, so these little fingers coming out. The axon, which transmits information, and then the synaptic terminal where, terminal where we release neurotransmitters to the next cell. But information that travels along the axon is called axonal transport. Then we have anterograde and retrograde. Basically, messages can go forward and backward. And you know, stress, mechanical stress on the nervous system, besides affecting blood flow, could affect axonal transport. Also, impulse traffic. And impulse traffic relates to the electrical signal that travels down the nerve, right? The action potential. <clears throat> so our nerves, right, they have electricity in them. And when we send a message, there's a change in that electrical current. And that travels down the nerve and causes the release of neurotransmitters to communicate with the next cell type. You can have uh, interferences with that uh, movement of the electrical potential. And this is often looked at with patients who have nerve symptoms. You might hear uh, physicians will sometimes do nerve conduction velocity tests where if somebody has maybe numbness and tingling in their fingers and they think that there's something wrong with their carpal tunnel, they can do a, they can do a nerve conduction velocity exam and look at are signals traveling through the median nerve at the appropriate velocity? And if the velocity really slows down somewhere, that can be a clue that there might be something there. Maybe in the carpal tunnel, maybe the median nerve is being compressed in the carpal tunnel, and maybe a carpal tunnel surgery to re to eat to re you know cut that area and relieve the pressure would help with nerve conduction. So. Nerve conduction studies are, are an example of where we can look at this impulse traffic, the velocity of electrical potential that travels down the nerve and look for areas where it's compromised. So when we look at forces, uh, stretch is one of the ones that comes up all the time when we're moving and our nerves actually possess pretty, uh, pretty decent tensile strength. So kind of a range here for some of our upper extremity nerves, 70 to 220 newtons for our median nerve, which is the one starts in our neck a number of nerve roots, C5 all the way through T1, goes down our arm through our carpal tunnel, gives us sensation to our thumb, index finger, middle finger, and part of our ring finger and palm, and part of our forearm. So that median nerve is a big nerve. It uh, is a little stronger than the ulnar nerve. Ulnar nerve is only made up of nerve roots C8 and T1. So it's uh, less 
you know, if you look at it on a cadaver, the diameter of the ulnar nerve is, is less than the median nerve, but it's still 60 to 150 newtons of force it can resist before failing. So basically they do these studies where they take the nerve and they pull on it between these strain gauges and they look at how many newtons of force can the nerve take before it fails. So that's how they study this. Uh, you know, <clears throat> these are biomechanical studies, so knowing exactly when the nerve fails, I mean, that's one thing to know, but if you're looking at the function of the nerve, there will be really, there would be quite a bit of problems way before the nerve fails. So while these are interesting, they're not always, um, the, these values are, are way above, um, you know, where the person would start having symptoms. So there'd be lots of interneural damage before failure of the nerve. So the, uh, if we look at the elastic limit of nerves, it's at about 20% elongation, so they can stretch. If you go beyond a 20% stretch, you will go beyond the elastic limit. The elastic limit of tissue is when, so if you imagine if you're stretching something and you let go, the elastic limit means it can go back to its normal shape. If you go past the elastic limit, we hit the plastic phase, and that basically means if you take a nerve and stretch it to 25% or 30% elongation, it won't go back to its normal shape. It will be permanently damaged. And then if you get up here, up to 25 to 30% elongation, you have complete structural failure of the nerve. And again, this stuff doesn't really come up in normal everyday life. You're, you're below this all the time. But if you had a car accident or a sports injury that really something really traumatic happened to a nerve, you could go beyond this and stretch it and maybe have some permanent changes to the nerve. So car accidents, uh, falls are another way that people uh, can have these stretch injuries on nerves. The birthing process, and I've got a picture of this in a second, when babies are pulled out of the birthing canal, uh, canal, sometimes the neck will be stretched as they're pulled out, and we can have things like herbs palsy where kids have reduced function of one arm because of a stretch injury when they were born. So when I, um, once a nerve is damaged, it becomes stiffer, so it loses some of its elasticity like other tissues in the body. And, you know, when we're thinking about that percentage of elongation, if we look at, we talked about 20% being the limit, elastic limit, at 15%, we lose all blood flow. So vascular supply is lost. So the initial damage that happens to a nerve is not because of something mechanical happening to it, it's because it's lost oxygen, which if we lose oxygen, the term for that is hypoxia. So if we lose blood flow, we also lose oxygen, and we get into a hypoxic state, and that accounts for the initial damage to the nerve. So here's just an image of a, you know, a baby being born. Um, <clears throat> in some of these cases, if there's you know, too much force uh, or force in the wrong direction or something, uh, you know, as the baby's being born, uh, it could, what happens is the baby's shoulder on one side can hit up against the mother's anatomy and that depresses the shoulder blade. And then the head is pulling at the same time. So you have a force being pulled this direction on the head and neck as the baby's being pulled out but the shoulder gets stuck here and that's pushed down. And that again, like that football injury I saw a second ago, it creates this stretch injury in the uh, cervical nerves, which can lead, like I say, to things like Herb's palsy, where uh, it, it, the kid ends up having motor loss in the arm on that side. So this left arm may have some motor loss depending on what nerves were damaged. Okay, so that's just one, one example of a stretch injury. Compression is the other side of the coin, and the critical level here is measured in millimeters of mercury. So at 30 millimeters of mercury, we, that causes ischemia. Ischemia means lack of blood flow. So if you have lack of blood flow, you lead to hypoxia, which is a lack of oxygen. Again, that's where damage is going to come from. So what types do we have? We have circumferential compression, which would be like if somebody put a tourniquet. <clears throat> if you had an injury <clears throat> and were bleeding, you had a tourniquet on, obviously the tourniquet might save your life, but which is more important, but the tourniquet could also cause some nerve damage because it wraps around the nerve and compresses it really hard. Carpal tunnel syndrome is considered a circumferential compression. The nerve is inside the carpal tunnel and it's surrounded by structures. And if that area becomes inflamed, it can, it'll wrap all the way, it'll affect all the way around the nerve. So that's a circumferential type compression. 
And then we have things like lateral compression. Uh, a disc herniation would be an example of that. If you had a really large disc herniation, it's pushing out to the side and a nerve is running by and it's just pushing into one side of the nerve, that would be a lateral compression. It's not surrounding the whole nerve, it's just pushing into one wall of it. Okay, so those, you know, um, <clears throat> let's see. Other types of common compressions, I mentioned prolonged sitting, right, on the sciatic nerve. That could be, uh, I mean, something like that could almost be circumferential because you're getting pressure on both sides of the nerve. Um, so you can probably come up with other examples, you know, um, where you're just basically pushing on a nerve and you eventually get numbness, tingling, pain, things like that. There's something referred to as the edge effect. So the edge of the nerve will usually be more damaged than the inside of the nerve. And also, if we look at sensory versus motor fibers, the large nerve fibers, which are the motor fibers, will usually be more severely affected. So you'll hear some people say that before they have pain, they just notice that their limb, their arm or their leg feels heavy or weak or sluggish, you know. So those are things people will say sometimes when they're having these kind of nerve symptoms, you know. So I end up seeing these where if people have uh, something happening in their back, like a they had a sudden disc herniation or something, they might, you know, in some cases notice that they're having some weakness or heaviness in their arm or leg as opposed to just straight on pain. So you may hear people report things like that. And that relates to this edge effect and the fact that larger fibers, which are motor fibers, are usually more severely affected. Here are some compression injuries. Again, we have disc herniations. Here's another uh, top-down sort of view of the spine. So here we think about just a normal intervertebral disc. There's the spinal cord. Here's the back and the posterior side of the posterior arch of the spine, spinous process. So the nerves are coming out through the intervertebral foramen. Everything looks good there. If we had a really large herniated disc, that could narrow this intervertebral foramen. And if it's large enough, even create mechanical pressure on the nerve root. As we know, a lot of people who have uh, disc herniations, the disc doesn't actually touch the nerve. Um, a lot of times the pain is just from inflammatory molecules and things in the area. But sometimes you get these where maybe there is actually mechanical contact, and that would be a type of compression injury. Carpal tunnel, this is somebody who has more advanced carpal tunnel syndrome. And so the, carpal, the median nerve is running right here through the carpal tunnel, and then it gives sensation and motor function to this side of the hand on both sides. So you can see in people who have really severe carpal tunnel syndrome where the nerve has been affected for a long time, you'll see this atrophy of the thenar eminence. This muscle mass, if you look at your own hand, you'll see this muscle on your thumb, the thenar muscles. Those in people who've had long-standing severe carpal tunnel syndrome will atrophy and they'll get this sort of deformity of their hands. So <clears throat> that again is a circumferential compression. We try to get people you know, some help, um, oftentimes surgery if it's that severe and their nerves that affected, okay? The, when we look at injuries to the nervous system, the, when you look at the force that's applied to the nerve, how long the force is applied, the duration, and the strength of the force, the magnitude, are both important. And how long it takes for the nerve to have damage is going to depend on these two variables, okay? So, if we look at compression, for instance, we said 30 millimeters of mercury was the threshold to cut off blood flow to the nerve. If you maintain that pressure for two to four hours, 30 millimeters of mercury, it would create reversible damage. So if after two to four hours you take the pressure off, the nerve, it might take a little while, but the nerve can heal and function of the nerve will come back to normal. If it's greater than four hours, you know, and this is going to vary, um, some, but greater than four hours, there can be irreversible damage. So again, your peripheral nervous system, even though we think about it being able to regenerate, there are times where it can't regenerate. And so if compression is held on a nerve for too long, even at a low level, it can lead to irreversible damage. Okay, so that's the duration part, the time that something is, that a nerve is compromised. So again, we need that sufficient time is required for significant damage. This you would need less time if the pressure is greater. So as an example, if this were 60 millimeters of mercury, maybe we'd hit irreversible damage after two hours, you know, or after an hour. 
So just to note that you know, as, as pressure increases, as the magnitude of the pressure increases, you need less time to get to a point of irreversible damage. When we look at compression, we also can talk about rapid onset versus gradual. So rapid onset would be things that are happening like traumas, you know, or things that happen quickly. A tourniquet's tied on, uh, and it quickly compresses that nerve. A disc herniation, a large, you know, I just had someone like this the other day. Uh, they were doing hip thrusts, really heavy th hip thrusts. Back pain instantly, instant changes in the leg, and pretty much over a week period, it was impacting his femoral nerve. He couldn't go upstairs anymore. It had such severe quad weakness from the femoral nerve, the branches of his femoral nerve being affected, that he ended up having to have surgery. And so that's one example. Uh, spine traumas, you know, car accidents, again, sports type accidents, something sudden that happens to the spine, rapid, quick onset. If you look at like really high pressures, like 600 millimeters of mercury, that for one second can lead to an impairment of nerve conduction. So the speed, the velocity that that signal travels down the nerve will be impaired after just one second if you get up to 600 millimeters of mercury. And imagine in some of these traumas, rapid onset traumas, it's a huge force compressing the nerve in some situations. So that can be damaging to the nerve in just a quick period of time. And then we have gradual onsets. These would be things like spinal stenosis. Like when people get older, you know, we think about older individuals sometimes have what's called central spinal stenosis or lateral spinal stenosis, uh, where basically the space, the intervertebral foramen where the nerve comes out, that can be, there can be arthritis, changes to the bone, um, ligaments in the area, and that can narrow the space for the nerve. And that happens over time as we age, right? It's not a sudden thing. So that's a type of uh, one example of a gradual onset of compression, and that can cause nerve conduction issues. People with severe spinal stenosis who are older often will report leg weakness when they're in positions, uh, maybe when they're standing all the way up straight and their spine is extended and there's compression on the nerves, they might report weakness, you know, and you'll hear them say, oh, if I bend forward, like I'm shopping in the grocery store, if I lean forward on the shopping cart, I don't get that leg weakness because they're flexing their spine. It gives the nerves more room. It reduces some of that compression. <clears throat> so that's an example of a gradual onset of compression. So neurodynamics is this area that in the rehab world is what we, where we really spend a lot of time. There's been a lot of cool research in this area. But <clears throat> it looks at the mechanical and physiological responses of nerves to movement. Okay, so it's this dynamic study, dynamic, you know, what's happening to nerves in these dynamic uh, situations. And our neural tissue, as I mentioned before, is always undergoing stress. You know, when we move, our nerves are being stretched and compressed all the time. And normally, they are able to accommodate that stress. It's just when, you know, maybe the duration of is too long, or maybe it's a really intense force and stress that our nerves can run into trouble. If those things do happen, obviously we can see weakness, pain, numbness, tingling, all the symptoms we think about with neural type pain. So here's a just a quick video I wanna show you on neurodynamic testing. This is just gonna look at you know, uh, an example in the upper body. This is something that in physical therapy, if somebody came in with symptoms, this is one example of a test we would do to stress the person's nerve to look to see if it reproduces their familiar pain or symptoms. And if that does reproduce it, then we can be more certain that that nerve is involved. So here's just one example. So let you guys check this out. Hopefully you can hear it okay. Therapist assessment, the upper limb neurodynamic test one. Claire lies close to the side of the bed. I've supported her arm, some weight on my thigh, and some weight taken through my hand. Note the starting position, thumb on thumb, and the tips of the fingers supported. The shoulder girdles are kept equal. They're stabilised. Step one is shoulder abduction to 100, 110 degrees. Then wrist extension, supination, shoulder lateral rotation, and then elbow extension, checking the responses to each component. In that position, 
neck flexion or neck lateral flexion away will increase symptoms of the arm if they're neurogenic and they'll be eased with neck lateral flexion towards the test arm. A variation can be performed using your elbow. This can really cradle the arm and provide support to someone who's a little fearful. The upper limb one position is carried out. And note in this position, I'm performing some wrist extension and elbow extension as a mobilization technique. Okay, so that's David Butler from the Neuro Orthopedic Institute. Uh, they do a lot of great research on pain and neurodynamics and things like that. But that is a you know that is a test for the median nerve. So as he mentions, you know he shows all the different components of the joint, how you'd move someone to tension that nerve at each area, the shoulder, the elbow, the wrist, and then at using the neck and head to test it even further. So that's a way, you know, that's just one example of test that we use for the peripheral nervous system. And then he talks about you can also use that to mobilize or floss, you know, the nerve. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So neuropathodynamics, so we talked about neurodynamics is the study of you know, the nervous system and how it responds to movement and mechanical stresses. Neuropathodynamics is our situations where there's an inability for the nervous system to accommodate the stress of life and the forces that are on our musculoskeletal system. So, and we can look at this from either a mechanical or a physiological perspective. Mechanical would be the literal kind of mechanical forces on the nerve. The physiological perspective would those, be those things we talked about earlier. Blood flow, axonal transport, and impulse traffic, this, the velocity and carrying of action potentials. Okay, so we, you know, this is this is based on the thought that the nervous system is one continuous organ. <clears throat> and again, this has been studied quite a bit, where they literally take cadavers and put pins. They might put a pin in one of the nerve roots as it comes out of the neck, and then move the arm, and they can measure how much that nerve root at the neck moves when the wrist is moved. So in that those types of studies have helped us understand how force in one area of the nervous system can impact other areas of the nervous system. So, and I've posted images like this on my social media channels before. They're really cool to see. You can dissect the nervous system out and see how it's all connected. When we look at pathodynamic changes, we can have extraneural and interneural issues in both of these areas. Extraneural means outside the nerve. Interneural means an issue actually inside the nerve. So, both of these areas could lead to uh, symptoms, neurogenic type symptoms. When we look at neuropathic pain, there's a concept referred to as Wall Wallerian degeneration, where when a nerve is injured, this basically kind of shows the physiological process of uh, nerve injury and healing. So when we have, you know, injury of the axoplasm, which is the, the, um, the fluid that surrounds the uh, nerve and then the axolemma is the membrane. These things, when there's disintegration, damage there, we're going to have macrophages come in and phago, go through phagocytosis, basically this eating. Macrophages are a part of our immune system. They help with cleaning up damage to our body. Lots of cases, if you injure a ligament, you know, other tissues. So they will come in and eat up damaged tissue and then we'll have this regenerative sprouting. So the nerve, once that's cleaned up, the cool thing again is that our peripheral, this is in the peripheral nervous system, we can have a regeneration. These sprouts can come out. Maybe you think about learning about neuroplasticity within the nervous system. This speaks to that. So the nerve can actually regenerate and grow these new sprouts and heal itself. Again, within reason, we can hit points of irreversible damage, but in a, in a situation where the forces were not past a certain threshold, we can regenerate and the nerve can heal. The intensity, so the strength of the symptoms a person has and how long they last, this hyperalgesic response, you know, where hyperalgesia refers to having pain when, some, when you are uh, encounter a stimulus that's normally not painful. So maybe somebody uh, rubs your arm, you know, which normally wouldn't be painful, but in an area of a recent injury, that would be sensitive and maybe cause pain. We've all had this before, right? You injure something 
even touching the surrounding area will be painful. That's hyperalgesia. <clears throat> the, that hyperalgesic response will be proportional to the degree of this degeneration that's happening in the nerve. So greater degeneration injury in the nerve will produce a stronger and longer lasting hyperalgesic response, which makes sense, right? And in nerve that's less severely injured, this will be less severe and less will last as long. So a proportional response there. But you know, an intro maybe you haven't heard this before, this Wallerian degeneration and just looking at kind of the physiology of nerve injuries and healing. Okay, so here's a just a, another cool cool kind of video that breaks down nerve injury. I always like to show these in class when I was teaching because some of these illustrations uh, are just do such a great job of breaking this all down. So here we go. Armando Hasurungan, Biology and Medicine videos. Please make sure to subscribe. Join the forum and group for the latest videos. Please visit Facebook Armando Hasurungan. In this video, we're going to talk about nerve injuries and the different types. But before we start, we should recap what a nerve is, as well as um, where it can be found, I guess. So here we have the brain and the spinal cord. The brain and the spinal cord make up the central nervous system, or CNS. If we zoom into this section of the spinal cord, let's look at some familiar structures. We have the dorsal side of the spinal cord, or the back, and then we have the ventral side of the spinal cord, or the front. We have a dorsal root and ventral roots, which are basically clusters of neurons that connect essentially to form a spinal nerve. And so this is a nerve. A nerve is not one neuron, but it's many neurons all packaged up into this structure. Now, whereas the brain and the spinal cord is part of the central nervous system, the spinal nerves is part of the peripheral nervous system, or PNS. In the spinal nerve, if we look at a sec cross-section of it, we can find blood vessels, you know, veins and arteries. Surrounding the nerve, in this case the spinal nerve, we have a sheath called the epineurium. Now, within the spinal nerve, we have clusters of bundles of neurons making up a fascicle. If we were to pull out one of these fascicles, it is surrounded by another sheath called the perineurium. And remember, all these sheaths are essentially like protective. And within each fascicle, we find neurons. Neurons here can be either unmyelinated or myelinated with Schwann cells. And surrounding these neurons, we have another sheath called the endoneurium. So again, starting from the very top, we have epineurium surrounding the spinal nerve, we have a perineurium surrounding the fascicle, and we have an endoneurium surrounding a, in this case, myelinated uh, neuron. So now let's briefly recap what a neuron is and its structure, because it's quite relevant to understanding the types of nerve injuries. So here we have a typical motor neuron. We have the dendrites, which receive signal, the soma, the body, we have axons, and this is a myelinated neuron because it has Schwann cells. And then we have the terminals with a terminal bulb where neurotransmitters are released and uh, initiate a sort of um, response. Okay, now let's talk about nerve injuries or neuron injuries. Let's start off by looking at the central nervous system, CNS. So now, most uh, CNS fibers, the neurons, they do not regenerate, and there's three reasons why. Firstly, cleanup is slow. Secondly, oligodendrocytes, which are a type of uh, glial cell, inhibit regeneration. And thirdly, the environment is not very optimal. However, neurons in the peripheral nervous system, or PNS, can regenerate. And this is because cleanup is a lot faster in the peripheral nervous system by macrophages, allowing for parts of the neuron that are able to regenerate to regenerate. Secondly, Schwann cells actually assist in the regeneration process. And thirdly, time is of the essence. So if we can clean up parts that cannot regenerate, um, et cetera, et cetera, regeneration can occur. And, but however, time is of the essence. Another fundamental thing to understand is that if the cell's body, the soma, is damaged, this, this, the, the cell, the neuron, cannot regenerate. 
However, if the if if the axon is damaged or the terminal, well, neurons can then regenerate. It will just keep it will just grow the axon back as well as the terminal. And the growth, uh, the speed of the growth is about one millimeters per day. Now on to looking at the classifications of nerve injuries. Well, you have three main types. Before looking at the three main types of nerve injuries, we should again just recap uh, a normal neuron here. So remember it has an axon and it has an endoneurium sheath type thing surrounding it. So this is normal. Now the first type of nerve injury, or the least severe, is called neuropraxia, where, is, where it is essentially demyelination. And this is essentially a reversible conduction block. So again, if I were to draw the neuron here and the endoneurium surrounding it, neuropraxia is essentially when you have compression here. And so the axon and endoneurium is still intact. However, the myelin sheet is sort of compressed. And an example of this is when we have when one experiences radial nerve compression or wrist drop. So if if you wake up maybe in the middle of the night and you've compressed your nerve, you can you have this sort of sensation. The second type of neuron uh, nerve injury is called axonotomesis, which is essentially where you have demyelination plus axon loss. Now, if I were to draw a diagram, here we have the neuron, and here, as you can see, we have a segment lost. However, the endoneurium is still intact. And so this actually allows, uh, this, this, this means that the, that, the, that the neuron can regrow, can grow back. And so because it also has the body, the body is still there, the body can, um, you know, grow the axon back as well as the terminal. However, the terminal in this case will die off. So the distal end will undergo what's known as Wallerian degeneration. This second type of nerve injury is commonly seen in crash injuries and, um, and displaced basically bone when you have fractured. The third type of nerve injury, which is the most severe, is called neurotomesis, which is essentially when you have demyelination plus axon loss, as well as one of the following. You can have either damage of the endoneurium, which I have just drawn here, and this means that you can have a fair growth, but not as well um, as if you would still have the endoneurium intact. Because you can think of the endoneurium as short, sort of like a pathway telling where the neuron should, should grow back. And then, or you can have involvement of the perineurium. And if you remember, the perineurium is the sheath surrounding a fascicle. And if this was damaged, you would have poor growth. And finally, if you have epineurium involvement, so remember the epineurium is the one surrounding the whole nerve, you will have no growth. And like always, the, the distal ends of the neuron that is basically slotched off will undergo de degeneration no matter what. Okay, so I hope you uh, that made sense. So remember the three types of nerve injury. You have neuropraxia, axonotomesis, and neurotomesis. Thank you for watching. Okay, great. Hope that was helpful. Hope you guys could hear that okay. But he does a great job of breaking down uh, some of those nerve injury categories that I don't have in here um, and talking a little bit about that Wallerian degeneration and just kind of the whole process. Just those videos are great for going from sort of basic fundamental things all the way out to uh, more specific things like nerve injury and healing. So when we look at neural pathodynamics, there are things referred to as normal tension points throughout the body. When we test people, these are spots where the nervous system is thought to be more adhered down. So, for instance, one that people, a lot of people feel is the popliteal fossa, which is the space behind your knee. If you take and 
test someone's sciatic nerve. A lot of people who are just normal and not having pain will feel a stretch behind their knee. And that's thought to be related to this normal tension point uh, for the sciatic nerve at the back of the knee. But we also see these in other areas, L4 of the spine, T6 kind of the mid-back, C6 or the base of the neck. So these are just normal tension points where the nerves maybe just don't move quite as much because of other fascial um, connective tissue attachments. So loss of neuromobility, when we think about a nerve, you know, some sort of pathodynamic issue, this again could be, we could have a loss of neuromobility actually inside the nerve, intraneural, maybe there's some, you know, issue with how the fascicles are moving inside the nerve. And then we could have extraneural on the outside of the nerve with the mechanical interface. And this would have to do with epineurium since that's the most superficial connective tissue layer. But maybe we've got scar tissue or some muscle that's pushing on a nerve that's outside the nerve that's interfering with how it slides. And so that could be, that would be part of the mechanical interface. So how might these things occur? There's lot, lots of different things, right? You could have surgery and you have scar tissue that's affecting uh, a nerve itself or affecting the nearby musculoskeletal tissue. So scar tissue, a sustained position, maybe like he was talking about, you fall asleep at night, your arm's in a funny position and that affects your ulnar nerve. You're sleeping like this and your ulnar nerve is stretched here. Uh, at the medial elbow and that leads to numbness, tingling, maybe an inability to move your wrist for a short period of time. Um, you could have, you know, double crush is a term that's used with nerves where if a nerve is pushed on or stretched in one area of the nerve, you can be more likely to have symptoms somewhere else. So, you know, maybe somebody's got a uh, something in a, maybe their median nerve, maybe they, the median nerve runs underneath the pectoral muscles. Maybe you have pectoral muscle tightness and that tightness there predisposes you or makes it easier to have something like carpal tunnel syndrome because it's the same nerve but it's two different spots on the nerve and that's called a double crush phenomenon. So a lot of times when people have nerve symptoms, we look at the whole path of the nerve and assess it and look for areas that might be compromising it. So sometimes you have people who have carpal tunnel symptoms, but their carpal tunnel is not the issue. It's something further upstream with the nerve. So maybe it's something in their proximal forearm. Maybe it's up in the armpit kind of pec region. Maybe it's muscles in the neck. And oftentimes if you can clear those things up, the symptom they came in for will clear up as well. So just some different examples there. Um, <clears throat> nerve mobility with normal function. This again is a lot of these studies come from cadaver studies and if we look at change in length, if you look at, you know, within the spinal canal, there can be as much as five to nine centimeters of movement when somebody goes from a flex to an extended position, if you bend forward and stand up. So quite a bit of sliding and movement in the nervous system there in the spine. If we look at the median nerve, here's one just going from wrist, finger, uh, wrist and finger extension to flexion, kind of from normal back to extension, seven millimeters of movement of the median nerve. So again, these are just, the, they put a pin in the nerve on a cadaver and move it and look at how far does that nerve actually slide when we move. And so our nerves need to be able to slide to accommodate normal movement. And if something restricts that sliding movement, well then maybe that's part of the reason for why the person has symptoms and we can work on mobilizing the nerve to help it move better. So, you know, we think back to those physiological changes. If there's inadequate mobility, we could have impairments in axonal transport, the movement of molecules down the axon, signal transmission, action potential movement throughout the nerve, and just the supply of nutrients and oxygen. So if mobility is restricted and you put someone in a position that compromises the nerve, it may uh, impair any of these or all of them, and those could be reasons for numbness, tingling, weakness, and pain. Okay, one last thing I want to show here. So, you know, I have lots of videos on my various channels, uh, you know, related to neural mobilization. But here's one just showing uh, somebody with shin splints. And again, David Butler is going to show how, you know, maybe something like shin splints that we would typically think of as being non-neural. You could have people where this is related more to the nervous system. And he's gonna show a case like this and then talk about how the nervous system could be mobilized to help that person. So 
in practice, we're taking nerve uh, tension tests and we're testing people to look to see if it reproduces their symptoms and if it does, then we may mobilize them and even give them exercises that help mobilize their nervous system. So here's just one example of a mobilization. Okay, pop hands behind your back, if you're comfortable. Sag down the middle, that's it, sag, slump down, and head forward. Now, pull your foot up, and now poke your foot out, rotate it out. Now straighten up the knee, straighten it up. What do you feel there? Yeah. Where do you feel that? My hamstring. Okay, and if I take your head up just a little bit. That's better. Can you straighten your knee more? There, yeah. Great, and bring it down. All right, now this one here, straighten up your foot, rotate it out. That's it. Now straighten out your knee. Uh, what do you feel there? In my shin. In the shin. Okay. If I just tip your head up a little bit, what happens? That's better. Great. Can you straighten your leg further? There. Great. And down. All right. Have a little rest for a moment. Now let's work that. All right? Okay. I'll get you to slump down again. Sag in the middle. That's great. Sag. Now bring your head down. That's lovely. Pull the foot up now. Rotate it out, up, and feel it pull there. Feel it pulling? Great, great, great. Feel it pulling. One, two, three. And just relax your head and leg down. Great. Can you feel how it goes instantly? Great. You're in control. Up. Come on now. Up. Pull. Feel it pull. Feel it pull. Enjoy it. You're getting at it. That's lovely. And back again. All right? One more time. Up. And feel it pull there. Feel it pull. Is it still pulling here? Great. That's okay. Can't hurt anything there. Can't damage yourself. It's a, just a lovely stretch. And back. Beautiful. I want you to do that. Let's do six, eight times a day and just ten stretches. But feel it. Feel it come on. Feel it come off. And there's something you can do after to make things really settle. So slump down again. All right. This time do the same thing with your foot up and out. Straighten the knee and tip your head back. And foot down. Feel that? You shouldn't feel anything with that. It's like treating all those nerves and soft tissues like a bit of dental floss. Give it a good flush out. Okay? That's great. Good on you. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Okay, so uh, just one last, you know, example of a nerve mobilization. There's tons of variations within the arms and legs of these, but he shows, uh, you know, that first position we would often call a tensioner because the nerve is on tension at the up throughout the spine and the neck and then also on tension in the leg and then when he has her rest and he shows her that other technique he you know calls it a flosser sometimes those are called uh, sliders but basically you're getting the nerve the idea is to get it to slide towards the spine and then back towards the foot and again it sounds like make-believe but those things are actually studied in cadavers so they put the pin in and look at how those movements cause nerve movement and the thought is is that when it helps people with their symptoms you know maybe it's improving blood flow to the nerve maybe it's helping the nerve just slide maybe it's helping with axonal transport or the ability of the nerve to send action potentials it could be any of those or all of them we you know that's more difficult to study in people but that's how I like to explain it to them um, when we're talking about how nerve mobilizations help pain so all right you guys Thanks for coming back. This is the end of the uh, biomechanics of nerve and nerve injury lecture. So let me know if you have any uh, questions or comments just down below and I'll try to respond to everyone. And, uh, you know, I have another lecture or two in this series, so I'll have a couple more coming. And, uh, yeah, I'll see you all later. Bye.